Here. And what's fascinating is one of our committee members did some research and he found out that bowling was actually closely associated with drinking establishments that was originally played on lawn, kind of like bocce, okay? So it's not too big of a stretch that in Dublin that there was a bowling alley behind the drinking establishment right here, okay? So kind of interesting. It was later turned into a house that was moved and torn down and something else was built there. So I just found that was interesting. This is literally the only spot on the tour you'd be able to see it. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk up the sidewalk. We're going to go to the crosswalk. We're all going to be ready to cross the road at the same time. We've got 15 seconds. We timed it already. All right. So let's head on over there. Then. Doesn't have a supply. Okay, the Dublin Inn. It was originally uh, the Dublin Inn was originally called the Golden Eagle Inn. Now there's a legend throughout Dublin of the Doan Brothers. Okay, these were infamous oh, gangster yeah. robbers. Yeah, you are. Well, here's the thing: the Dublin Inn actually featured into them getting caught. They were here celebrating one night. And they got a little bit tipsy, a little too over celebratory. And while they were running away, they actually got caught. One of the Dolan Brothers got caught. What's interesting is there's there's two stories of how Dublin got its name. One is a lot of the settlers were from Ireland and they wanted to name it after their hometown. The other one is at the time there were two inns, double inn. So that might be the other one. So whichever one you prefer, I prefer the two in one because it's a but nobody knows. I don't think I think I think those were the folks who just moved north and they, and, they, and, they, and they said, you know, we don't have two inns, let's just use their name. Let's be making that up. Okay, so moving up to the next room. Now, that can very well be true to what he said. Imagine for a second, before Loretta shows you the picture, okay? Thank you. Right. Imagine for a second a modern day automobile dealership right here in Dublin. This is like this is like the size of just a showroom, let alone the entire facility, okay? So flip the page, Loretta. Wow, that really does look like a showroom. This is what this is what it looked like in the 40s and 50s. Oh wow! So they actually had the uh, the cars right here, and they sold they sold Plymouths, they sold uh, uh, Dodge and DeSotos. I couldn't tell you which ones were what. And a Corvette. Look at that. That is a bet, isn't it? 56, right? All right, we're moving up. Tribe number 224. All right. So back in the uh, early 18, in the early 1700s, 1800s, people 
people were fascinated with Native American culture, okay? So what they did, this organization was a fraternal organization of uh, craftsmen and workmen, and they adopted a lot of the Native American customs. They wore a red velvet sash with gold trim. You can actually see one of those at Cooker's Central Store. They have a museum, you can see that. What I, what I find really interesting is that it's probably likely if this group were still around in 2021, they'd have been asked to change their name, okay, from the Red Man, Cotalusin, or whatever, to something else. The other thing I found absolutely amazing is that they were number 224, which to me implies there were 223 similar organizations in the United States, or the colonies at the time, that were doing the same thing. What these guys were known for doing is they were woods all back here, and they would have Native American ceremonies and rituals back in the woods, and they'd camp under the stars, and that was what happened. So that was until about 1913. And then in the early 30s, this building was taken over for 10 years as an elementary school, because if you were born in Dublin, you were educated in Dublin. And this was one of them, and for 10 years, and then after that, in uh, the early 40s, there was a group called the Junior Order of Mechanics, and that was made up of laborers, tradesmen, uh, craftsmen, and their whole reason for being was to promote solid ideas in the community. That was what they did. So what's impressive is they had a long run. So they started in the late 30s, early 40s, and uh, they ran, they didn't disband until 1994. That's a long time. So the building's now Salon Excellence. You get your hair cut here, and there's apartments up on the top. And at least they uh, left the red. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. You're next. Okay. You ready? Go ahead. Awesome. All right. So the building you're looking at right here, okay, this was originally, believe it or not, this was the Dublin National Bank. You can flip the page to your picture. This was What's when. What's her name? What's her name? What's her name? Loretta. <laughs> Loretta flipped the picture, okay? Because she, she's my professional. You didn't know Loretta was on the payroll, did you? Loretta, you earn 50% of what they pay me. Yes, yeah, same here. I'm giving you a volunteer here. So, the first thing. Hotel. You see the ornate uh, woodwork around there, okay? Well, back in that day, there were four different channels. Six miles in a car. You blink and you're there, okay? Six oh, miles with a horse. You had a ways to go, okay? So they needed a bank. So in 1928 or 27, they bought this building and they converted it to a bank. You want to flip your page there, Loretta, and show them what the bank looked like? <laughs> this is what it looked like originally. That's right there, all right? And then when it was the bank, if you notice, it looks a lot more business-like with the straight across, they took out some of the frilly oh, woodwork on it, okay? Yeah, that does. So as you can see, so what's interesting is so, so here you go, so here's the deal. My favorite part of the story was that the back end was a house too. So uh, Henry Heimbacher, Schambacher, and his wife Edna lived here, and then they ran the bank. He was the president, she was the only teller at the bank. So one night, a fellow came in to their kitchen and tried to rob them. And Schambacher was like, what? Edna came in, screamed so loud, the thief fled, and they didn't get a penny, all right? What was interesting was three years before that, though, four men from the area did come in, and they made off about $3,500. I don't know what that is in today's money, probably in the hundreds of thousands, okay? The funny thing is, is they all lived around here, and they ended up busting every one of them in Buckingham, Doylestown, and Philadelphia. So, uh, you know, crime still didn't pay that. So, uh, so that was the Dublin National Bank. What's interesting is that it was ended up being bought by the Bucks County Bank. Anybody remember Bucks County Bank? Remember the building where the medical facility was right there? It was Wells Fargo. It was a real low triangular building, but it's been since torn down. And uh, so that's who bought them, and it's... with 
bits of trivia about Dublin, okay? So quick question. How much do you know about Dublin? So here's the thing, well this is why we're here, right? All right, so what year was Dublin incorporated? Was it 1832, 1841, or 1912? I heard a lot of 1912s, right? 1912 is correct because 2012 was the 100th anniversary for those of you who quick math, okay? You'll get that. And then the other thing, too, is that those other two years, they actually applied with the incorporated objective. So that was the third time to charm. We're wrong. True or false, another easy 50-50 toss-up for you. In 1942, Clarence Moyer, a renowned farmer in the area won $25 for his prize honey and $10 for his egg entries in the PA Farm Show. Is that true or false? True. true. You're all saying true. It's false. I knew it. Oh, he, you didn't say it. He won, but he only won $5 and $2 for his eggs. All right. One more. True. Dublin once marketed its local newspaper. It's called the Dublin Gremlin. Dublin Gremlin as the rarest newspaper in the world. Is that true or false? It's gotta be false. Yeah, why would he make that up, right? No, it's actually true. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it might have been because it's such a tiny circulation. It made it rare, maybe, I don't know. I got one more for you, and then we're gonna head up to the next problem, all right? Did you know that in the 1920s, Dublin's population was 222? It wasn't until 2012 that the population had grown to 2,158, so almost 20, so it's almost 10 times growth over that, over that period. We're going to watch the thing about Dublin. There are three properties on the Bucks County uh, Historic Places uh, on the list, okay? And anyone name one or two or all three of them? St. Luke Park. What? What? You're all pointing to the building behind me? We have, we have a hand over there. Uh, yes. Yes. So it's this one, St. Luke's Cooker Central Store, which is where, which is on our tour, and the last one is the Jonas Moyer House, which we're going to go by, and we'll talk about that one more. So our next stop is going to be here at St. Luke's. Let's go take a look at this historic property.
they were able to purchase a two-acre tract of land for $400. And this, where this church is located, is that two-acre tract of land. A wooden church was built, and um, it was fairly small. It was um, only 45 feet wide, 40 feet deep, and 18 feet high. And apparently it wasn't put together all that well because after 20 years they decided that it was going to need a lot of repairs or they were going to have to build a new one. So there was a very contentious discussion and meetings on this and they finally decided they would build a new church in 1890. And that's when they procured the services of the uh, fairly well-known architect Milton Bean. Uh, the church was finished in 1891. It was estimated to cost $3,000 to build this church in 1891. I did a little bit of research and I found that for a project in 1891 to cost $3,000 in today's money, it would be about $4 million. I don't quite think it would be $4 million to build this church now. But, um, you know, that gives you some idea. Um, now, we didn't do this by ourselves, this, all this planning, because at the same time we were looking to build closer to Dublin, the Lutheran people were also looking to build a church. So they got in with our plans and they, we became a union church. And that means that one church building houses two congregations. So from 1869 until 1961, we were joined with the Lutheran congregation. And then in 1961, they decided that they needed more room, and so they built their own church which is just west of River Road, where Living Hope Church is now. Um, the original church building ended over where Pastor Mary is, is sitting. Um, that section over there was built on in 1941, and to this day is still considered the new section. So, you know, say, oh, go over to the new section. Well, that's that over there. Um, the, the original stained glass windows were part of the old wall, but they were carefully removed, and when the addition was put in and the new wall, those stained glass windows were put back in there. It also, the addition gave us the uh, another Sunday school room downstairs and the porch area. Um, out front where we came in. In 1992, we applied for and we were accepted to be on the Bucks County Register of Historic Buildings um, through the uh, Conservancy, the Heritage Conservancy. And um, I guess you'll be hearing on the tour that we are one of three buildings in Dublin that are on the registry. Um, all the woodwork in here is all, and the pews are original to the 1891 building. Um, everything in the new section was built to match the old. The bell in the bell tower, the bell tower's in there, and when you leave you can see a big um, rope hanging down. Our bell is rung every morning before the beginning of the church service, and uh, that bell was acquired from a fire company that was disbanding. Uh, back in 1918, one of our members happened to be the chief of Dublin Fire Company. Um, I mean, you, may, you may hear on your tour the name of Lloyd Cranhamel or Butch Cranhamel. And he was a member here. He was also the chief now at the fire company. So it was through his connections that we were able to get the bell. The uh, church was heated through drip coal stoves 
and lit by kerosene lights until 1925 when electricity was put in. So all the kerosene fixtures were taken down. Um, but back in the 80s, somehow cleaning out was being done and the chandeliers and the wall sconces, and there's two wall sconces downstairs in the Sunday school room, they were found. And through the efforts of one of our lady Sunday school classes and um, uh, some private donations, we were able to get them refurbished and wired for electricity. Um, I guess that's that's about it on the actual building. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Uh, before you leave, if you want to circle around my way of the corner case up here has some pictures of what the building used to look like. Um, up front, we used to have, there used to be a wooden, like, fence. I don't want to say fence. Um, I don't know what the word you would use. A railing. Yeah, that's good. Wooden railing with a gate in it. And um, I'm assuming it might have been a place where possibly the Lutheran congregation went to take communion. Um, but that was removed um, at that time. Yes. So you said these this, these wooden buttresses all here are original? That they they are there? all original to 1891. Okay. The, the Reformed, because this started out as a Reformed congregation, um, the Reformed denomination originated during the Reformation in Germany and Switzerland in Europe. And I always felt that it had like a German influence to it. And does remind me very much uh, because Dublin was settled by a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch, which do have German roots to them. Thank you very okay. much, Karen. So, if you guys want to follow me, we're yeah. going to walk by the, uh, the memorabilia here, which is really neat. This is a really good picture of sure. uh, the history here. Public schools and a lot of uh, churches as well. It's built in 1810, stone farmhouse. Now, it's interesting, so there's mainly our different architectural styles. We're going to be talking about federal, Georgian, Gothic revival, okay? But keep in mind, architecture is a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and the reality is, is that a lot of what we're looking at was built in the 1800s, and it's been covered over by aluminum and plastic, and you know, it's just a sign of the times. This is a nice one because it's not. It's, it still has the exposed stone. Okay, one of the things I want to make a point at is that you see the shutters. Those are real shutters. You know, not like the ones that are attached to my house that are just for looks. They, they never move. Those are on hinges. And you can always tell the difference because of the slack. The slack are angled down when they close, that will be the way you do that. The slacks are angled the other way, you're baking. You're not doing anything. You're letting the water into your house. So I just thought this one was worth showing you. This is a pretty home. Uh, and then again, this with the shutters. We're going to continue to all right, this home built in 1825. It's, a, it's called the Georgian style, okay? And you look at it, you're like, oh, it looks like every other house I've seen, right? Georgian property, all right? Uh, this one was built in 1825, uh, and it's just, a, Georgian is very variable. Like I said, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I got pages and pages that'll explain all these different styles. I'll give them to you when you're done, but you don't want to hear me going on and on and on. So, just pointing it out, again, most of the architecture you're going to see in Dublin is a variation on the theme of federal, Georgian, and Gothic revival, which we're going to see coming up. Two that we talked about. Is it more Georgian or more federal? Georgian. Georgia. I hear Georgian, I got an argument for federal, and it, it, it's listed in the register as federal. By the way, I'm not making this stuff up. In, in 2015, Jeff Marshall with the Heritage Conservancy literally did a survey on every home built this before, uh, I think. Uh, 1850, okay, and I have this, and it tells you what the major style is. This one's under as a federal, so Scott didn't make that up. Jeff Marshall made it up, okay, so if you want to see it, I've got it, all right? 
Hello. Roslyn, can you step up a little bit, please? Thank you. Here we've got two homes that are kind of similar. You see the pediments on the front? So what haven't we talked about yet? Gothic Revival, right? So these are both examples of Gothic Revival where they have more ornamentation. I ever tell you I hate those trunk bufflers they put on. Um, they put more projection on porches, more ornamentation. Uh, you've got steeper roof slopes are also typical of Gothic Revival. This one I was told, we, we did a dry run last week and I, I was blessed to be with Rod and Carol Schultz who were the historians for Dublin and they run Cooker Central Store. And Carol informed me that this was the undertaker's house and if you look in the back, those were the carriage uh, uh, units where they used to store the uh, carriages and the horses. So that one would be, this one would be uh, 122. sled factory, okay? So it was a carriage and a sled factory. What they ended up doing was they converted the second and third floors to houses. So the owners of these businesses over there lived in this property, okay? Now it's a, uh, an auto detailing and tattoo shop. What's interesting, it was built in 1870. Does anyone want to take a guess at how much it costs to build a property, a three-store brick property in 1870? 50 grand. 50 grand. 5,500. 5,500. 15,000. 15,000. 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, if we were playing the prices right on the final thing, you would all have been over and, 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 and Bob Barker would have gotten all your stuff. <laughs> but no, it was actually $1,268.62 is how much it cost to build this in 1870. So over the years, this was also an auto dealer probably competing with those guys down the street. They had uh, Will, Willie's, John, Willie's, it's, uh, Willie's Night Automobile. Didn't last but maybe 10 or 15 years. And then Alice Chalmer, that was all uh, farm equipment. You gotta remember, they were all farms, so this is where they would come to buy their farming equipment. And uh, so we're gonna move on. Yes. Does it have any relation to the Plumstead carriage building company? Uh, they were probably competitors. I find it, and I think yeah, it is, but you know what's fascinating is that it's not the revival, it's got the peaks and it's got the little pedestal, but it's flat in the front. So like I said, everything's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I would say it's more of a general front. But who knows, if you take out all the sides, it looks like that. Take note on this property here. This is called Jonas Moyer's house. Uh, it's, uh, it's officially listed in the Gothic Revival style. Remember, architect, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Personally, I ran this by my favorite architect, Joe Phillips, and Phillips and Donovan, uh, one of our architects who's on the committee. And Joe said it's got a little bit of Queen Anne in it as well, too. So we're gonna walk around this building if you like the building, it's for sale. So on the other side of it, I'm going to ask you to take a guess of what you think it costs. Oh, it's not bad. Oh, it's not bad. But in the 1980s, they changed the whole interior to be offices. So I looked this up online. Uh, the other day before the tour and uh, it's listed for sale. Anyone want to take a guess? It's not Somebody must have taken it. Maybe there was an ornamental window in the middle 
that got pulled and they put brick in because it didn't fit for the offices upstairs? I, honestly, I don't know. Uh, and are the shutters real or are they fake? Oh, they're real. They're real. Look at that. I got an expert <laughs> over here already. six people that show up to our meetings, um, which is good because we're able to get things done. And, and, and for the most part, we're a pretty cohesive council, so um, we don't have too many issues, you know, where, you know, and, you know, it's not so much this guy's a Republican, this guy's Democrat, you know, I mean, you can't be signified, especially this building, without no noting some background on Mr. Moore. He was born and reared on a farm. He left school at the age of 18 years, at the age of 20, he was actually employed as a school teacher. <laughs> he went into the mercantile business, which he, he, which covered the next 30 plus years and had a very successful business. He married in 1848, where him, him and his wife had three children. It was stated that no man in this township is more highly respected than he. He was respected by his peers. He held many positions of trust, including director of the Doylestown National Bank. Uh, he was a director of the Dublin Dairy, Dairymen's Association. He was also a trustee and deacon for the Hilton, Hilltown Baptist Church, indeed a property of the Hilltown Church. The church building was built after 1880, so, and I don't have an exact year, I apologize. Um, and the building remained as a church until the early teens, and I have the year 1913. Now, I think that year is significant because Dublin Borough was chartered. And it housed the post office for 52 years. Yeah. Now, I'm going to talk to you and give you a little bit of history, but there's a lot to look at here. So if you want to wander around and look, you go right ahead. If, as long as you can see and listen at the same time, we'll be doing fine. So Mr. Cooker purchased this store in 1918. It was a two residence at that point. We know that because we had to take the ceiling down when we had a water problem on the third floor. There was a staircase that came down behind the counter over there, and the other staircase came down here. <laughs> so that's how we can verify that's actually what it was. The granddaughter of the Frankenfields that lived here still lives in this community, and she's in her late 80s. Uh, we had post office here. In the beginning, it was just a table in front of the window, and they just had a like, little cubby holes there. <laughs> And then in 1923, Mr. Cooker was commissioned as postmaster. And then we, the town built up so quickly that he had to get regular post office boxes. And you can see by the pictures over there, uh, the post office, post office boxes. Mr. Cooker was passed away in 46. And when he died in 46, 
His wife took over as postmistress and ran the store. And she ran the store until her son, Paul, the stepson, the stepson of Mr. Cooker, he took over and ran the post office, and she ran the store until his death. He died, very, he died at 38 years of age. He died, I think he was in 54, 56. And then his sister took over as postmistress after he passed. So Mrs. Cooker remained as the lady that took care of the store until 75, when the post office wanted to move because it had grown so much and they wanted her to add on the back of the building and she said no, she was at that point in her 80s and she said no, I don't think so. And she didn't want to change the store that much. So that's why they moved down behind, they built a building down behind the diner and that's where they moved. And Aunt Catherine moved with them. And my mother-in-law was the clerk here for 25 years. She went down there also to the post office. So Grandma was here by herself in 1975. And she decided, she was in her 80s, and she decided that she no longer wanted to have the store. So she closed the store, gave most of the post office boxes away. I do have a, a few of them but gave most of that away and sold everything that she could from the store. What she couldn't sell, she either put up on the second floor or put on in the barn that used to be in the back, which I will show you later. Uh, but some of the items on the shelves, like all of this stuff, and this stuff, this was all packed up. All the cards, pretty much, that's in the bottom of that case, were all cards and they have her signs on it where it says five cents. Those were all grandma's signs. Uh, the markings on the floor, this count, this counter here ran this direction. But when I opened my consignment shop here in 1996, I wanted to open it up more and have a counter so people would be walking. I wanted them not to walk back there at that point. Now any, you can walk anywhere you want to. And the other counters were all here. So you can see, this one back here was also, there was a counter in the other room, was here, and those two were over there. So it was really kind of congested. But the reason she had that, she had ice cream over in that one to cool. So the kids came in, the bus let the kids off over at staff store. The kids would come in here for penny can or ice cream. Mm. Or whatever it was. So, uh, I just look around, I don't know if I can, if there's anything else, I can tell you that we're going to go into this other room. You can see how wide this wall is. This is the original part of the building. Underneath this is a dirt basement floor. It's the same as it always was, and there's a huge walk-in fireplace down there. The building is dated back to 1831, but when the Conservancy came in, they felt that it was much older than that much earlier than that because of the walking fireplace downstairs. But <clears throat> because Jeff could only date it by documents, 31, that's what we went with. Um, given questions, all the counters that are here are original to the store, except the one on the top where the candy is there, that top counter was donated to us by the Pearl Buck Foundation about six years ago. Uh, it had been left to them in a will, and it, it doesn't lock, so they could use it in a store. So they donated that. The, the case here with the bread in it and the case over there on the counter were purchased for us and given to us years ago. But everything else is original. This is original to the store. Uh, we call it a ledger. If anybody wants to come around, you can come back, back here and look. It's original to the store, and we still have bills in here. The bills that are in here that have not been paid were from Mr. Cooker's previous store, which was across the street from Borough Hall. And he had a store there. We know he had the store in 1911. But you can see here, we have bills here. Because, you know, in those days, the people paid on time because they didn't have a lot of money. I have bills here from 1915, 1916, and this Myra Wolf, plus uh, there's a Linford Bishop in here and several others that still have not paid their bills. <laughs> so I just want, if you know, if, if, if 
if anybody, where's their descendant? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where's their descendant? Yeah. That's the late field. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the Beatles weren't very much. I mean, in 1916 or whatever, but you know, they got crackers. It was like I don't know, four pounds of crackers for ten cents or something like that. But we've never seen another one of these, uh, and no one else is that we've had That's in the store. And this is just, you know, just for writing on, and then I guess they just put paperwork there. I have all the receipts for all the counters in here, as well as the adding machine. This is not original. There a, was a brass one here, and I think when Grandma Cooker closed the store, she either gave it away or she sold it. The uh, spool cabinet over there in the window, that's the original, original to the store. It still has the thread in it. And the die cabinet over in that window is original to the store, and it's still full of dye. Plus, I have two cases upstairs if I ever uh, need to sell it. <laughs> Do you know anything about the history with the pandemic of 1916, 18? Did they close the building? I have, see, I don't have any knowledge of any of that. They didn't, I don't know. I wish I did, yeah. but I, I don't know. I don't know anything that happened before 1919, pretty much. Oh, okay. And it's always within this, pretty much this building, yes. But I'm open four times a year. I only open four times a year because I didn't want people in the community to say, oh, you know what, I've been there, it's got to be the same, because it's never the same. We're constantly getting things donated to us. We're still purchasing things that we can put in the store. And we're, I'm always moving things. At Christmas time, there'll be a lot of Christmas items here, old Christmas items that people would have come into the store to buy. This, this we just did, we just, this we just received this. This was from Mr. Cooker's store out Maple Avenue from 1911, and that's his Christmas, all the things that he has for sale there. This was the post office through this store. Those are the only post office boxes that I have. Someone in this community either bought them or Grandma gave them to him, and he took some of the brass doors off to make banks. You know how people oh, sure. used to do that? That's what he did. But anyway, we know that those are our post office boxes because we know all the people that had, on the back it has the names of the people, and we know those people. So, um, I don't know, you have any questions? The, the bookcases are all original, but they've been painted in, when the, uh, after Grandma closed, she rented to a bath boutique for a while, and they put those uh, uh, Formica tops on everything, you know. That's not original, that was all wood, that was all natural wood in the day. Carol, when's the next time you're open? I'm going to be open the 18th and 19th of December. Did everybody put that in their in their calendars? At 10 o'clock, from 10 to 4, but 4 is just a figure because it depends. I have regular people that come in all the time. They can be here till 6 o'clock. So we plan to spend the entire day here, so we bring food with us and that sort of thing. Do you have any questions? I'll try to answer them if I can. Are these containers filled with the old products? Some of, some of these are brand new. That ch that thing for the, the coop tablets, those are brand new, never sold. Those were here. They were out in the barn. Uh, the coffee's full. Most of the things that are on the shelves are full. Wow. Yeah. Most of the things. Thank God Grandma kept everything. And <laughs> she saved everything. And the cards that are in the bottom, they were packed in old, the old candy can boxes. She packed them away in that, and that's a, that's a duel for me yeah. because then I got the candy boxes and the cards. <laughs> so there's another section here on history, right? Yes, we're gonna go. When you go through here, you notice, or if you haven't noticed, you will see it on your way out. Uh, our honor roll sign. There's one gentleman that's still alive. His name escapes me. Rutherford, thank you. Rutherford and one of the other guys, one of the guy who owned the bookstore at the time, okay, they teamed up and they created a historical group, okay, and the whole purpose for that group was to prevent that from happening. And ultimately what came out of that was a historical, was a harp, a historical architectural report where every home that's labeled in that harp has to get permission to change anything that you can see from the street to throw the curb. And you want to put new windows in, you got to go to the heart. That's the reason why Doyle's town has retained its historic character because it's got a heart. And it's because those guys in 61, 62, 63 said, we don't want your quarter of a million dollars, we'll stick with what we got. And that's how that community was preserved. It's an amazing story. They were so successful that they took the show on the road and in uh, Doyle's
Willstown Borough, there's a, a suitcase that's got stickers from all the towns that they went. They even ended up in Hawaii coaching other towns wow. how to create their own historic architectural review board. So great story. Great story. Next video. Times, there have been so many additions, and what I found fascinating, like that is not my favorite architectural style, okay? But it's got a place in, in modern history, okay? And full stop. And uh, at, the, at the tour or at the panel presentation, they were asking the developer, are you going to retain the exterior character of the building? And I kind of went, I don't even know which one's the original diner. But it's here because I have to pose. <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on it. It only took me four locations to get to it. So you can come this way. I'm going this way. Come on. This way. This is where the next tour is. We're going down to the station, uh, which was Bishop's Service Station. It was started in the 1920s. And today, Mr. Bishop himself, which is, I think, the third relation of the guy who ran it last, is going to tell us all about it. It's being renovated to be a uh, brewer, right? Yep. Brad's favorite use for historic property. <laughs> yes. If anything can turn into a brewery, I love it. <laughs> this is mixed use. These are going to be apartments upstairs and uh, businesses along the first floor. And then you'll see that the uh, St. Luke's Medical Center was just recently opened. And, uh, I don't think it'll have elevators. Well, I think there'll be common areas where you go in to get the elevator. And then there'll be an entry into the long street. The and then there'll be an entry the long street. So, you want to gather around so you can hear them. Danny, they're all yours. All right. How's everybody doing? Oh, yeah. Good. Having a good time? Tired. Yeah. And then this is Rob Lottery. Go inside. It's probably some innovative ideas. We found business cards where he was starting to uh, advertise that he was going to build fire apparatus in his shop, which never fruitated, but anyway, we took care of all the fire company equipment. Uh, when the fire whistle went, most of the shop emptied out. We supplied uh, a lot of the manpower for firefighting and ambulance corps. Uh, the factory supplied people for that. Stauffer store, my uncle Herb Stauffer was uh, one of the members for that. Uh, in 1964, Butch retired, my dad took over. My dad's name was Harvey E. Bishop. He then became fire chief, and uh, he was uh, fire chief until, I think, 1981. And uh, I was uh, squad chief for a number of years, and also was an EMT 
for that. Lots of stories there. We would be here all day if I told you those stories. Anyway, he sold gasoline. He had five brands of gasoline. He had Sunoco, Sinclair, Esso, Mobile, Texaco, a gas called John Iyer Young, which evolved into City Service and later to Sitco. We added an, S, an SH on that just for slang. Uh, Pearl Buck was one of our famous customers. We used to work on her limousine and her other cars that she had, and we also supplied gas to her. In the 1930s, the price of gas was 10 cents a gallon. In 1950, the price increased to 18 cents a gallon, which was horrible. Everybody hated that. There was a full service center, meaning the attendant would come out and pump your gas, ask to check your oil, your tires, and clean the windshield by hand. You don't get that anymore. Uh, Butch also owned the ground behind the garage where they had, uh, and then the diner where they had the fire company carnival for many years until they built the place down here in 74. They had uh, ball games at night because there was no TV. Uh, one of the stories was that Butch played second base, and uh, one night Goldie was the manager of the, the team, and he wanted to pull him off second base. And Butch said, to hell you will, I'll turn the lights off and go home, so he stayed at second place. So. Uh, players would come from Dolestown, Percocy, Sellersville. Uh, some of the uh, interest waned when TV became more available. Uh, as I said, the fire company carnival was here, held here until 74. It uh, all field became Little League, and there was other Fields opened up on the other properties joined us for Little League games, and finally that uh, diminished. And uh, that's about it as far as that goes. I have some pictures here. This group loves it. the buildings, the character of the buildings that were here. This was one that we absolutely wanted to, to make sure that we could preserve. And, uh, after uh, we closed on it, our, our whole vision here was always sort of like a cafe, diner, food, sort of slash entertainment type of thing. And, and, and it started to evolve as the project started to evolve. Um, and uh, what we're getting ready to open here shortly is, is sort of like a food market with the brew pub. But they're not brewing. Um, so the Shamity Creek Brewing Company, which is located in um, Bristol, down in Lower Bucks. Um, we're a pretty popular uh, craft beer maker in Pennsylvania. Um, they're going to be using one of their licenses, and so we took uh, what was the, the one, two bays here in the garage, and there were two on the other side. So that, that other side is going to be the Shamley Creek. In here are going to be, in this particular space, are going to be three food vendors. So right over here is going to be a brick oven pizza. You can see the brick oven pizza called E Tree Wood Fire Pizza. They're actually down in Bristol Borough. Um, right here is going to be Juicy Burritos. So it's a California company, actually, they're in California and Colorado. And, you know, it's sort of like a Chipotle style, but it'll be focused on burritos. Right where Denny is right now, um, that is, so you, you heard him say the diner, the Dublin diner, was originally Goldie's. Um, and so that is going to be Goldie's Grill. And so that'll be a grill with hamburgers, hot dogs, wings, french fries, that kind of thing. And at the very front of the building, which was the office, um, is going to be Nina's Waffles Ice Cream. So oh. they're, in, they're in Doylestown, New Hope, Newtown, Pebbles hey, Village. Yeah. They're Pebbles Village. So they'll be opening with their, their famous waffles and ice cream. Uh, opening date, Rob? You got plus or minus a month or I got six? a lot of pluses and a lot of minuses. <laughs> Um, we won't hold you to any of them. So, so um, at, you know, it, it's it, interesting. We, we, we really, our, when we started this project, our game plan was this was going to be open last year at this time. So we're a year behind. And you take in COVID, uh, equipment that we can't get, weather. I mean, it's just I could go down the list. We are still waiting for doors, believe it or not, to come in that we can't get. We're waiting for a fryer. We're waiting for a couple of fencing, which we ordered back in July. So to answer your question, we're hopeful if we get the doors this week and get this done, that the Shamley Creek will open this weekend. Wow. Okay. Don't hold them to that. Yeah, don't hold them. Years ago, if you know anything about the Bible or the Old 
Testament, there is a, a real character. Uh, his name is Nehemiah, and uh, he, uh, uh, if, if you go back and look at the, the story of, of Israel, uh, after it was divided and conquered and, and everybody was displaced, Nehemiah, I always looked at as sort of what I, I would call the first redevelopment. And he wanted to go back and fix the uh, ruins, uh, the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and so I, I've always had an affinity uh, and an alignment with Nehemiah. So we started Nehemiah Development Company. I started an entity called Nehemiah Real Estate Investments. Um, we actually, the first project we did was a Crystal Bar. Uh, where we bought a block of the downtown, actually it was an old vaudeville theater uh, that we converted to uh, sort of a mini version of this. It had some residential units in it, some retail and some commercial, and then we kind of brought back that, that block to life. So uh, this is, uh, uh, we've done some other projects in between them, but this is sort of the next big layer of, of repurposing, redeveloping, and rebuilding. Is there retail in that building? In the, yeah, the first floor will have a retail. It'll have well, it'll have commercial space. It'll have uh, Sabona Chiropractor. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah Sabona's moving up. Uh, a dental group is moving in there. And then, if if you know anything about Dublin, the post office used to sit right there. And they're now in our building in the square in a small space. But they're going to have their new retail uh, place in the first floor of the mixed use building. So we'll have. Uh, dental, chiropractor, and postal service, and then there are 30, 30 apartments on this, a total of 30 apartments on the second floor. It's not a lot of rentals like that. It's not yeah. new that is in the market at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you can you know, come over here, grab a burrito, a, a, a waffle ice cream, and, and a beer if you like beer. Walk back home. Great. Well, thank you, Rob, for the background on it. We're going to get moving. We're going to head over to our next. Yeah, let's go. We'll take a look at that, and then we're going to head over to the next. You see a mule and a scoop. So and now it's going to be a heavy mule. Spreading stone on the next one. So the best thing that ever happened in the TV. This is an aerial view of the show. I've been watching lots of hearings. So we're pictures so of the show. You can see all the heavy gases. Okay, that's a picture of my dad myself. That's well, my dad and you the And all these different like, it's numbers. Yeah. 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 You never knew where to go. This, yeah. is, the, this yeah. is the building. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the original start. This was all an apple orchard here. Apple yeah. orchard. Yeah, there was nothing else around. It's only the factory. Uh, just about 400 <laughs> Not a happy time. Who's Hummer? <laughs> <laughs> That's a Dodge power wagon. It is an M37. M37. Free and more, 1954. Wow. We bought that for parts for this truck here because they were interchangeable. And we got that finding out it was pretty good shape, so we got that one too. What's the deal with the letters? That was navigation, navigation for aircraft. Okay. Before they had GPS. Mm -hmm. And you can see the roof was painted. Yep. We had pilots coming in saying that we saw your shop. We wanted to come and see what it was like. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Okay. Don High was one of the pilots. Is that the coastal uh, route? Harris? I don't know. 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 The early air mail had signs on the ground with arrows. We talked about Delmar Hersey Mill. Did we talk about that? Up on Mill Street. We talked about that. They had a trick thing going on. They had a school bus and they went out to local municipalities and brought people into work. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. So, yeah, there wouldn't be any transportation. Right. So, use the first page and then go back to this one because this is some interiors. Chamber for inviting Dublin to be a part of this tour today. And we also have to acknowledge the work that Rob Lockery did with the uh, Nehemiah Development Association to pull off this gorgeous project that we're looking at right now. I want to start by saying that this
There was a wood frame building here. It was the Harry Hyde Clothing Company. In 1924, Dariff and the Dublin Pants Factory purchased the Harry High building, raised it, and then built this as brick. Um, pants were manufactured upstairs, inspections were held downstairs, but in 1966, they decided, I'm jumping ahead now, 1966 they decided they needed more expansion, more room because of the amount of trousers that we wore in 66. You're pointing at me? I was. <laughs> I was yeah. one. The, the man in short pants. Yeah. Ah, I was short, in short pants. pants in 1966. <laughs> they were tough to make. Anyway, uh, so they built this, this to match, this end to match this side. So it was actually two separate back. They had um, modernized this whole building, they said, because of the uh, increase necessitated, necessitated by the increased manufacture and demand for trousers. They called this a modern dual-light factory because of the windows on the sides. Now, if you take a look at some of these older photos, this one right here, those windows weren't great for ventilation. It was like flip them out and close them up. And there, there was windows on both sides of the building so they could get flow through ventilation, which is probably not quite as good as air conditioning, but it made, it, it made the employees happy. Um, most of these employees that came here were townspeople. They walked to work. A lot of people drove to work. This company employed between 150 people and 400 people at its peak. When it had 400 people, they were running three shifts. Most of the time, they ran two shifts. I remember as a kid, they ran two shifts. There was a day shift, second shift. At 2.30, 3.30 in the afternoon, you would see the transition up and down the street of the people going home and, and going to work. Um, most people in town that worked here, I knew. So when you're mowing the grass in town, up down there, the like wave to people that you do is pretty cool. This was a nice, homely, homespun town. I don't know how else to say that. I probably missed that up in the city. Um, this company was called H. Dariff and Sons, and their specialization was. Um, from coast to coast. So their, um, the Dariff Company had three separate plants, one in, one in Perkasy, one in Pennsburg, and one in Dublin, and they, their um, master plant was in Philadelphia. Their total production in pants was 26,000 pairs of trousers a week, and that was covering all four plants. Uh, you'll see here this is a, a photo dated 1956. Uh, once a year, it seems that they would come out and they do a group photo. There are photos going up into the 60s. I have some earlier than 60, than 56. Um, a lot of these people in this 56 photo I know, born and raised in town here. Uh, you'll see here there's some interior shots. There's a couple ladies in here that I know. Uh, there's a receipt book here. Both. These are, this is for billing purposes only. This was Mrs. Mrs. Lillian Bishop. Her clock number was 23, and she made for such and such a date she made a dollar 48. And then if you go in here, you'll be. It tells you how things were were billed like for the federal government and things like that. I also have an, a ledger here that has the employees' names listed and the amounts of money they made on such and such a date. Uh, this was all piecework material here. You had to go in and produce. If you didn't produce, you didn't eat. So those, those numbers will reflect that in there. Um, 
what else can I say? Great aerial view here. And I think this is an early 60s building, building picture because of the cars. This Victorian was over here in the corner. They tore that down for this development. This wooden water tower I wish I had today, but I don't. Any questions so far that I confuse you or not? I know you're talking about very Thank <laughs> you. 